The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. gentlemen to apologetics show number one on the restoration radio network i'm your host phil stone and i'm very pleased to welcome his lordship bishop donald sanborn rector of most holy trinity seminary in brooksville florida welcome to you my lord thank you for having me here restoration radio is pleased to present the apologetics show as a members only episode and it is not available for individual purchase and download to receive access to all Restoration Radio episodes, please visit restorationradionetwork.org and go to the member area on the menu bar. Our extensive website will show you all sorts of details about becoming a member. So my Lord, Apologetics is using the text The Defense of the Catholic Faith by Francis X. Doyle, SJ. However, it's not available in the public domain as a PDF or ebook, so far as I can tell, um, and just a note to our listeners there, um, if they have found a uh, public domain PDF or ebook, um, please um, uh, email us. So we'll be covering the defence of the Catholic faith. And uh, In episode zero, we explained what apologetics is and who might benefit from a study of the topic. Essentially, um, anyone who wants to defend uh, d- defend the faith, whether it's the frustrated Catholic who, um, who gets a uh, knock on the door by the Mormons or um, just anyone who, who wants to defend the faith. And he just hasn't been able to find the right arguments for him. And I suppose what we were talking about in our last episode, my Lord, was um, just how everything fits. And it takes you through step by step a science of uh, of defending our faith. Um, So if you haven't heard that episode yet to our listeners, I recommend that you go back and start with that one before commencing this episode. So now we commence in earnest. Um, The first lesson of the text on page two uh, of the defense of the Catholic Church is um, uh, religion in general. So... This uh, text is a little different to a catechism in that it doesn't pose um, straightforward questions and answers, but the way we'll take uh, our listeners through this is for me to to present um, each of the headings and and, uh, and ask Bishop Sandlord to explain it. So I used to resent religion, my Lord, under the definition of religion. Uh, I was a bit of a disenfranchised ex-Protestant, all dressed up with nowhere to go. I was always getting into debates with my friends about God. I would argue strongly that God exists, but I didn't need to go to church. Religions are just a man-made thing. Um, of course, I had no idea. I mean, man doesn't really need religion, does he? Perhaps you can start with this definition of religion. Yes, uh, the, it's from the Latin word religare, which means to bind, and so its, it's uh, etymological definition would be the, the bond uniting man to God. Uh, its essential definition is it is the virtue by which man pays to God the homage due to God because of his supreme and singular excellence. So, the uh, obviously man has a relationship to God as a creature to creator, and this relationship of creature to creator necessarily binds the creature to the creator as his ultimate end and therefore generates a necessity to pay homage to God, to obey God, to know God as he is, uh, to set aside false gods and to worship the one true God uh, and to to posit acts of adoration and reverence and, and worship uh, that are pleasing to God. So just from creature-creator, you have all of those things that arise out of that relationship. And just as a footnote to that, that is why the doctrine of evolution is so wicked, because it it ruins the the most fundamental aspect of religion, the the very foundation of the virtue of religion, which is the creature-creator relationship. 
that is why man is religious, because he knows he's a creature. He knows that he cannot exist except if he had been created by something that is existence it, itself. And, and he cannot have intelligence unless he was created by something that is intelligence itself. And <clears throat> these things are all grained into, uh, excuse me, ground into, into his intellect instinctively, uh, just as, you know, the way a, a, a child or uh, any young animal goes instinctively for its mother. You know, it, there's, there's an instinct of, of dependence. And uh, that it, that it has come from something greater than itself, and uh, so so evolution detaches man from the creator, and therefore ruins all religion in general. So that that's a, a really evil and and dreadfully stupid system. Uh, but that's a whole other show. <clears throat> um, uh, so uh, so that that's what religion is. So uh, next question. So religion may be considered in its content and in its exercise. Yes. Uh, the the content of religion is the sum total of truths and laws which determine man's moral relationship with God. Its exercise means that is the, uh, the acts that man posits uh, in, in accordance with these truths and laws. So there are certain acts of religion, such as well, the holy sacrifice of the mass or praying or other things. That's the exercise of religion, but religion has an objective content which dictates the exercise. So you will worship God according to the truths of, of the religion, or let's say, you know, if you're in a false religion, the, the dictates of the false ideas of the religion. So, you know, if... if you know, as the Aztecs, you know, they worship the the devil in the form of a snake, uh, and they they sacrifice to this devil snake uh, the whole day long. Uh, who and in all of those you know, primitive religions, uh, which were all devil worship, there was always a, a, a requirement of of human sacrifice and blood offerings. Uh, you know, they they will. Uh, organize their practice or their exercise of the religion based upon their quote-unquote dogmas. Uh, and so also the true religion is exercised based on the true nature of God. So that's a good segue into the third um, point, uh, the third question, which is religion is either true or false. Yes, a uh, very important point and a very much denied point today. Uh, the true religion is is that which gives due homage to the true God in the manner decreed by God or dictated by right reason. And a false religion is one which gives homage to a false God, for example, idolatry, or <clears throat> to the true God in a false way. All right? So uh, you could uh, give false worship to the true God. That's possible. Uh, today, everyone is uh, infected with ecumenism, which is to say that there is no possible truth about God, that it's all whatever you want to say about him. It doesn't matter as long as you uh, have certain religious feelings, certain interior uh, experiences about God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you call him, whether he's Allah whether he's he's uh, Christ, whether he's the Jewish God, or whether it doesn't matter as long as it's true for you. And uh, I just had somebody tell me this the other day. Everyone is infected with that. Everyone. And the the, the obvious conclusion is that there is no one true religion. That there is no revealed religion or not even if we exclude revelation, that it is not possible for man to know by reason what the true God is or who the true God is uh, or what the true religion would be. You see, it, 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 God did reveal to us himself, uh, but he didn't have to. He could have just let man proceed according to his reason and discover him by reason. And, and that would have been what we call natural religion. And... Uh, 
just as there is an orthodoxy in mathematics and an orthodoxy in biology and an orthodoxy in geology and all of these other sciences, so in the most important science that affects man, not only here but after the grave, the is uh, there is an orthodoxy. There is something true about the object of religion, something false about it. In other words, that, that there are, uh, there's a, uh, you know, if you, if you deny the truths, uh, even of reason concerning God, you're in falsehood. Um, and uh, that was going to be my response to this person who was telling me it didn't matter. <laughs> I was actually, it was actually a physician who was telling me this, and I was going to say, he didn't give me the opportunity to say it, but, well, isn't there an orthodoxy in biology? Or can you say that the liver is made of cheese and get away with it? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, everything that is important to man has an orthodoxy. Um, and you have to take your medical boards and you have to prove that you believe the orthodoxy and hold to the orthodoxy. And sure, there are disputed things, but there are certain undisputed things that you must adhere to in order to get a license to practice medicine or in order to get a license to practice engineering. You know, you can't build a bridge, you know, if you don't believe in the law of gravity. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or avionics, <laughs> you know, if you don't believe. I mean, it's just absurd that, that people would say, well, you're crazy, you know, you're out of your mind, that you would like us to approve you, even though you are so unorthodox about these most basic truths that everyone accepts. But when it comes to religion, oh, it's impossible. There is no orthodoxy possible. And yet it's the most important orthodoxy that you believe rightly concerning God. Because if you displease him through false worship or the worship of a false god, you're going to hell. Just as you go to prison if you commit a crime in this country or any country, you go to prison. Why do you go to prison? Because you disobey the laws. So, you know, while people cry out for justice to be done when there's a crime committed, <laughs> they reject the whole idea of it when it comes to the punishment of their own crimes after they have died. Where do we, why, why does a judge have the right to cut somebody's head off or send him to the electric chair or do whatever else he does? Why does he have the right to do that except by the power of God? We don't see animals setting up courts of laws and juries, uh, you know, with wigs on as they have in England, or, or the the uh, you know we don't see that. The two, you know, the the one that is, is the victor is the one that has the strongest teeth, and, and he's considered the best because he defeated everybody else in in the eating of the carcass. So that's the, that's the world without reason. That's the world without God. Uh, but, you know, human beings crave justice, and, and there's going to be a justice in the next life, too. Uh, and so uh, the, there is a true religion and a false religion, and so my point is that the knowing of the true religion and the rejecting of the false is absolutely and most importantly necessary for human beings. So as a resentful ex-Protestant, therefore, my Lord, I was wrong when I thought I didn't need religion. Um, Religion is necessary for man, which is a great uh, leading to the next uh, next point, point number four. Uh, religion is necessary for man. Yes, because, uh, as he says, right order demands this homage of God. There has to be, uh, according to right reason, a recognition of the the supremacy of God. There has to be a recognition of our dependence upon God. And, and him as supreme being, even before any consideration of the Catholic faith or, or anything beyond reason. Reason says that if he is God, he demands, uh, he will demand and he deserves uh, respect and obedience and uh, forms of, of worship that are pleasing to him. Uh, we must manifest this. We must, uh, as he says in the book, we must submit our intellect to what he has revealed uh, we must uh, submit to even things that we can know from reason by uh, concerning him. Uh, and um, so, it, it, in other words, God cannot just be ignored uh, because 
he is our ultimate end. If we come from him, we must return to him. Uh, we are dependent upon him, just as a child is dependent upon a parent. Uh, and and uh, so, uh, so religion is necessary. It, it is uh, uh, for man to fulfill that obligation to God, and God it would be offended if the obligation is not completed. Um, just as a parent would be offended if his child s- sticks his tongue out at him or shows him disrespect. Uh, <clears throat> so that, um, and this, uh, he says in the, uh, in the course of this, that all mankind demands that this homage be given to God. There has never been a, a, a single tribe or, or any kind of people on the face of the earth that has been godless until the 19th and 20th centuries. But if you look at the ancient world, the priesthood was always intimately bound with the government in all of the ancient peoples. The the Romans were so religious, quote-unquote, I mean, they were superstitiously religious, but they were so religious that a priest could enter the, the I mean, a, a Roman pagan priest, could enter the Senate and forbid what was being discussed. Just forbid it. And that was the end of it. That's how religious they were. Uh, the the and uh, the emperor was the Pontifex Maximus. He was the head of the the state to, uh, gods and so forth. You know the worship of the state gods. And uh, uh, the uh, the Egyptians had a very very strong connection between the pharaoh and the and the priests. Uh, uh, the uh, Greeks. So oh, the Greeks would always consult the the Del- Delphic Oracle and. Um, the uh, all all of those peoples had a very very tight connection of religion and government uh, because it was necessary. You you could the idea of being godless or atheistic was just the, you couldn't even think about it. Nobody had any any notion of, of that idea that somebody was godless. It just was non-existent. Uh, so, uh, so that is further proof of the necessity of it. Whenever something is universal like that, and both over space and time, it is a sign that it is uh, something that that proceeds from reason uh, and uh, is is found reasonable to to human beings. For example, that murder is wrong. See, you have, all peoples have considered murder or stealing wrong. <coughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, and he also adds that uh, human society demands this homage of God uh, because human society is impossible if there is not a recognition of God. What I said about the judge. Why can he send you to jail? Why, why does he have any authority over you? He's just a human being. Why? Why do you have to do what he says? If you take God out of it, the only reason why you're doing what he says is that you fear what he can do to you, put you in jail or execute you. Not that he has any power to do so, but he just happens to be in, in power, so to speak. You know, he, he is the part of the ruling hunter. He, not that he has any power from God to do it. If you pull God out of society... You ruin the very basis of all the, its operations of justice and law. What's a law? Except something that has power in as much as it conforms to the eternal law of God. Uh, uh, otherwise, it becomes just a, a something that is based on pure fear, just like an animal world. Well, you, you know, you have a gun to my head, so I must do what you say. There is no true obedience to law. Uh, if you pull God out of society. So God is also necessary for the proper ordering of society. What stops you from stealing? Mm. (laughs) Except the law of God. You know, if you see uh, $10,000 on a table, what stops you from picking that up and putting it in your pocket? Except the law of God. What stops you from murdering someone that you dislike? The law of God, he has a right that, that to live that I cannot take away from him. Uh, uh, you pull God out of all of those things and you have a really horrid world, and we're seeing that happen now. We're seeing the 
the effects of pulling God out of uh, society and the general disintegration of morality uh, at, a, uh, at an alarming rate and with alarming effects. The idea so, that somebody would go crazy and just shoot people up because he's having a bad day or something like that, or he's angry, or he, he, well, you know his parents were nasty or something like that. <laughs> so, it's it's very serious. I'd like to remind you that you're listening to Apologetics on the Restoration Radio Network. I'm your host, Phil Stone, and I'm joined by His Lordship Bishop Donald Sanborn, Rector of Most Holy Trinity Seminary in Brookshire, Florida. And today we've been discussing the religion and why it is necessary for man. We want to remind you that Apologetics is a production of the Restoration Radio Network. All rights are reserved and any duplication without explicit written permission is forbidden. To obtain permission, please write to mail at truerestoration.org. So, my lord, on to the, uh, the fifth part of, the, of this lesson. Um, religion did not arise from prejudices of education. Uh, yes, this is an objection of some, you know, that, that people were brought up with religion and that, uh, you know, therefore they accepted it uh, as just something that, that was there. Uh, and uh, no, because uh, although, yes, you are brought up in religion, you are given religion as a child, uh, and uh, it nonetheless, when you become an adult, you see the re- reasons why you have religion, just as you are given many other things as a child for which you see the reason when you grow up. Uh, you you are given, uh, for example, what's in the trust fund for you. <laughs> and you see the reason for that when you grow up. Uh, the uh, uh, many other things uh, that that you know manners and uh, the things that you may not understand when you're a child, uh, but you understand when you grow up. So the uh, the fact that religion is communicated by education does not reduce it to some sort of a non-existent thing like the exist- existence of Santa Claus or something like that, that, that is if it had no basis in reason. I mean, that's absurd. Uh, many, many things are communicated to children because they are based in reason, and, and that's why children grow up as reasonable and balanced people. Um, even basic mathematics and <laughs> basic justice and uh, you know, being polite to people and <laughs> is communicated for a reason. Uh, and uh, those reasons are, are clearly available to anybody uh, when they grow up. And so so you can see the reason why you were raised a Catholic. You thank God for the fact that you were raised a Catholic uh, because you do see the, the faults of other religions, and you think, oh, my goodness, uh, I could have been in that. I could have been worshiping something, you know, some sort of god in India, you know, that, that with, that, with an elephant's head. <laughs> true mm-hmm. you see those celebrations that they have that are always you know at certain times on the news you know the elephant's head and they dress themselves up in all sorts of odd things or they put powders on their faces and you th- i mean i think my goodness you know what ignorance human beings fall into without the true faith that mm-hmm. you could take these gods seriously and do all of these really odd things in order to please them uh and you know, it just is horrifying to look at, mm. especially since Christianity has been preached, you know, everywhere. That these people persist in these Hindu myths. So there's a, a further objection in the book. Um, uh, religion did not arise from the legislation of tyrants who saw it in it a means of restraining their people. Yeah, that, that's another. Uh, the the um, no, and it, he points out that religion always pre-existed society. Uh, that uh, you know, there were always, uh, in all cases, uh, uh, some religion uh, before the society was was set up. So I mean, uh, um, uh, so the uh, religions always survive. Even even in the French Revolution, for example, which did everything it possibly could to extinguish Catholicism. Uh, did not manage to do so. Uh, when Pius VII came to see Napoleon in 1801 to crown him, uh, he uh, the people were on their knees as his carriage passed. And that was 
uh, 12 years after the French Revolution. Mm. Uh, you know, if you know any history of that revolution, it, it was it just determined to extinguish Catholicism in France and didn't succeed at all. And the reason why Napoleon wanted to be crowned by uh, Pius VII was he understood that religion was so basic to human society that he had to incorporate it into his program, that he would never be able to pacify France if he did not pacify religion. Uh, That's how strong religion is. So, I mean, it's really, uh, I could give other examples, but it it really is uh, an absurd uh, uh, accusation. I mean, the Roman Empire tried to extinguish Catholicism, and, and, you know, that all backfired. (laughs) It, it uh, uh, no, and the Catholic religion was never, never promulgated at the edge of a sword. It was always promulgated by reasonable arguments and and preaching of the gospel, and uh, it was never. Uh, and also, it was a, to no man's benefit because it gives you such a strict code of, of morals that, that you, know, you wouldn't accept it unless it were true. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a pretty tyrannical set of, of governments around the Western world. Apparently, they don't need religion uh, now. It sort of puts paid to this objection. They've tried to uh, separate church and state, and they've done a pretty good job of it. But that just means that um, religion, um, you know, is, is necessary for uh, for, for man. Um, but even, that out. even the the separation of church and state in all of these. Um these Western countries, where it's the only place where you have separation of church and state, um, mm. is in the Western countries, which were once Catholic, or at least you know some form of Christianity. Let's say uh, the uh, it hasn't. Uh, it, that's not what killed off religion in Europe. What killed off religion in Europe is Vatican II, <laughs> and that's a whole other argument. Uh, that, that, that's from which we're you know I'll. I'll uh, we'll talk about that another time because we need to move on here. But that, that's from Vatican II. It's not from uh, 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 the attempt to suppress religion in those countries. Mm. It's, it, it's easy to see that Francis Doyle did not live after uh, Vatican II. Um, mm-hmm. On to the next point, um, my lord. Uh, religion did not arise from fear of the unknown. No, uh, that's again, uh, you know, another you know, that that people couldn't explain a thunderstorm, so they said it's the anger of the gods or something like that. You know, uh, I mean that some people might have said that. Uh, sure, that you know some primitive cultures may have come up with that, uh, but no, uh, reasonable religion never uh, was based on that. Uh, the it was uh, based on the fact that there were things unknown to us, that is, that there were mysteries that were beyond our ability to know, and that we, uh, but we could know certain things just from looking around that, you know, these are creatures, they must have a creator, the creator must have certain characteristics uh, in accordance with the beings that we see, and therefore we are bound to worship this creator. There, there's n- no fear of the unknown in any of that. Mm-hmm. Uh uh it's in principle religion is a very very reasonable thing and uh can you know all of its tenets uh, all the tenets of what we call natural religion can be proved by reason that god exists that uh that he uh that the there must have been a, a creator of this world uh and that the creatures are are dependent upon the creator all of those things can be proven the immortality of the soul uh and so forth yeah. So on to the next point in the in the text, religion is natural or supernatural? Yes, uh, I've been alluding to that already, that there is a whole set of natural truths that can be deduced concerning God purely by reason, and that's what we call natural religion. Uh, and then there is a whole set of truths that are revealed by God, and that is the basis of what we call supernatural religion. Uh, so uh, that God exists and that there's an immortal soul are truths of natural religion. Now, they are also revealed by God, and we believe them based on the authority of God revealing. 
but we could know them by reason. And uh, so uh, th- that's the, the essential distinction. Now, if if God had decided not to reveal himself, then we would have been left to our own lights to figure out who he was and how he should be worshipped. Can we come on to um, religion as a science on page 7? Uh, it says that it proves that God has actually communicated definite truths to man, then it demonstrates these truths from their sources, establishing its conclusions one upon another, thus con- constructing a system of demonstrated truths relating to God's and man's relations to God. Yes, that, that is a definition of theology. Remember I said that theology mm-hmm. takes the revealed doctrine and deduces conclusions from the revealed doctrines and therefore makes a system uh, of truth concerning God, and that's sacred theology, and that's uh, that's a science um, of sacred theology, yes. So we've gone from uh, religion is um, either natural or supernatural, and it is a science, so therefore that leads us to the conclusion that there is certainty in religion. Yes, that that, uh, it's uh, that uh, even in natural religion, there is absolute certitude based on the certitude of existence, that we see something existing, that it doesn't have existence by itself, it must have it from something else, because it can go out of existence, and therefore there must be something that has existence by itself, and that we call God. That is absolutely as certain, it's as certain as, as you know, we see the 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 light in front of our eyes uh and it uh has uh, all of the the qualifications of certitude which is evidence the, you are certain if you have evidence and if you can see the evidence for what you know so it's not only to have it but that you can see it you can see why you know what you know why uh, it's necessary that what you know is true that's that's what generates certitude and religion is loaded with certitude because it's based on principles that are absolutely certain and never changing it's not like the Mm. weather and that leads us to the subject matter of religion which is of course uh, God Um, yes and 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 anything related to God including how, how we get to him that's moral theology Okay, so that um, basically closes out our show, my lord. Um, uh, so we've covered the doctrine of religion and its, necess- uh, its necessity because man must pay homage to God. Um, yeah. I want to thank you, my lord, for your time and being with us on this episode. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add in summary before we close out our episode? No, I think uh, we've uh, we've covered all of our material today. Well, once again, thank you, my lord, um, for your time. We'll talk to you again soon as we continue this series. Uh, God bless you. Thank you very much. Bye. If you have any questions for Bishop Sanborn or feedback on this episode, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us at apologetics at truerestoration.org and we'll pass along your questions or comments to Bishop Sanborn and rest assured that all correspondence with us is strictly confidential.
program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovusOrdoWatch.org. Oh.